Album retratti, l'urra pismi, l'urra pismi, paesi moti, millina fi, millina fi, ti ha pegnia, la matri, tu che mi sti, impara il fti, li erja da pismi, mi uggi, li erja da pismi, mi uggi. Nidakum l-ura għattini parti tal-program l-ura fiżmin. Għadiċu għonijiet nitkel mudwar Jerry Anderson u għat naraw għanki klips mil-produzzjoniet ta' Jerry Anderson. Il-produzzjoniet ta' t-fulitna. Serin naraw fl-awwel parti, fl-aħħar tal-awwel parti, rajna parti mil-istorja ta' t-Tandabajz. Għanna morru issa, għanna raw dokumentarju fuq kif kienu jisiru daw il-produzzjoniet, kif kienu jahdmu daw nil-papiċ, kif kienu jamlu għom jitċaħalqu, jitkelmu barra l-papiċirs xkello miktar. Għanna raw flem kien, għanna raw dan il-dokumentarju u għanna raw għanki uħut minnis illi kienu jamlu l-vuġijiet. Nara wu koll il Gerry Anderson. Five, four, three, two, one. Thunderbirds are go. to that. This house isn't going to be able to stand up to this punishment. What are we going to do? International rescue. What, what was that? Stand for international rescue. They will have it. Okay, McGill. Get onto that radio. Send out a distress call. Yes, sir. If anyone in this world can get us out of here, it's them. I was stuck with making pictures using puppets which couldn't move quickly, they couldn't move precisely. And to make matters worse, I was making children's programs. Now children love action, children love movement, children love, sadly, destruction. So now, how do you do that with puppets? Jerry Anderson, in a sense, did the impossible. He just said, right, we can't make live-action science fiction films, let's make them with puppets. Anyone else would say, well, this is crazy, you can't do it. He did. And the genius of them was that they are both a parody of the real thing and also can be taken very, very straight. But it also seemed to epitomize a world in the 60s which was always sun-drenched, which was bang up to date, highly optimistic, and where men would go to the moon very soon. And you really thought that uh, the whole thing was going to come true, and of course it didn't. Giant! Alligators? Giant alligators? It's a lonely spot far up the river. It might be a tricky spot to land. The terrain sounds treacherous. All right, John, tell them we're on our way. Give Scott a direction when he's airborne. Scott, off you go. Yes, sir. International rescue to the rescue, and giant alligators growing fatter by the minute thanks to a top-secret drug which is accidentally spilled into their swamp will soon be cut down to size by the Tracy brothers. Oceans of nostalgia if you're a child of the 60s, and for anyone too young to remember the Thunderbirds puppets first time round, the key to a magic kingdom on strings ruled over by Jerry Anderson. Anderson and his puppets were in at almost the very beginning of commercial television, with series like Supercar, Fireball XL5, Stingray, Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet. And Lord Grade, who legend says created independent television single-handedly, soon took a commercial shine to Anderson's masterly marionettes. The uh, puppet series at uh, Jerry Anderson, that is the advance of all the science fiction that you see on television now and in cinemas of course such as star wars and all those films i would say to the writers the first stage is to take a character and devote 
say, 10 minutes to getting to like him or her and caring about him or her. Then, in some way, put them in terrible jeopardy. Now spend the rest of the show getting them out of that jeopardy, but working against the clock, having set a time which was goodbye time. And then in the closing moments of the show, almost count down the seconds, like 10 seconds left, and, and literally at the last moment, save them. And so that was the simple formula. Father, I've arrived at the distress area. How does it look, Scott? Oh, pretty hazardous, Father, pretty hazardous. There's three massive alligators attacking the house where these people are. Think you'll be able to deal with them? Well, they're sturdy brutes. I don't know how effective our missiles are going to be. And besides, the house is right in the line of fire. This is International Rescue calling McGill. Do you read me? Loud and clear, International Rescue. Hey, where exactly are you? We're in the basement laboratory. Do you think you'll get us out in time? Well, I'm going to try to frighten these reptiles off with a slight diversion. All right, International Rescue. But I don't know how much longer we can hang on. Uh, don't worry. My buddies are on their way in another craft. We're going to get you out of there. Jerry Anderson had found a formula that kept a whole generation of children, and their parents too, on the edge of their seats in front of the family television set. But it wasn't an original formula. Anderson simply hijacked the race against the clock from the cinema, which he'd worked in since leaving school at 14. First as an editor, and then as a producer, who founded his own company in 1955. I had reached the point of bankruptcy when somebody came along and said, will you make 52 puppet films? And that was when I became interested in puppets because it meant money and it meant the saving of our company. But that's the only reason I became interested in puppets. A kindly particular term to explain what it was that was special about the Thunderbirds and that generation of puppets. Well, it was a word that I put together, super marionation, yeah. super marionettes animation and uh, this again really was an attempt to try to separate out what i was doing as opposed to the puppet show but i really was always desperately trying to get into live action and get away from puppets and you couldn't get the down things to walk you always had to cut them down you know only photograph from the knee up and if they had a gun in their hand and they fired a gun, unless you had the hand wired to the body, it usually did like a Catherine wheel. It fired, went up over his shoulder and did about three revolutions <laughs> and ended up <laughs> nine times out of ten facing the puppet. So he's just shot himself. <laughs> Derek Meddings, prince of special effects in the Anderson Kingdom during the 50s and 60s. And now a monarch in his own right, having created the special effects for the later Bond movies and made us believe that Superman could fly. Meddings invented the futuristic cars and planes and rockets in which the Anderson puppets careered round the globe, as well as the assorted flashes, bangs and crashes which all but stopped it in its tracks. From the beginning, Derek Meddings and Jerry Anderson looked into the future and then had to decide how to make it work on television screens today, today being the brave new 1960s. We are ready to blow. I repeat, we are ready to blow in 60 seconds from now. Repeat, 60 seconds. It's the marvel of the age. Supercar. 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 All I know is that somewhere out there, there's a living creature in distress. I can't let that call go unanswered. Steve Zodiac not help anyone in trouble. All the large departmental stores that had a kitchen section, we used to go around and sort out bags and bags of these various items like calendars and some unusual sort of teapot. Having collected all these things, we'd go back to the studio, chop the handles off, chop the spout off, and use the center part. And then we used to buy hundreds of plastic kits a monogram, airfix, and all the kits that were made at Revel. And we used to sort amongst all the pieces and take out the pieces that we knew you couldn't really afford to make. And then with a lot of design going into it, we used to add these pieces and stick them on. We used to use a lot of squeezy bottles and plastic containers, and we would stick it and maybe make one part, like we might make the cockpit, or we would find a cockpit from a larger kit. 
and then we would build on this plastic bottle or whatever it was and having stuck all the bits on then we'd give it a spray of grey so that it brought it all into one colour so that you couldn't see it had fairy liquid on it and disturb your eye and then we would look at it and then we'd either add more or take pieces off and then having agreed that it was a good shape then we would paint lines on it and separate areas so that it looked as if there were panelling and then dirty it down and in the end of course we had some very very good craft okay virgil we're all set let's have a crack at these alligators F.A.B. Go back and see how they look. I think the five Thunderbird craft were written into the script and what they were supposed to do, but very vaguely. And um, I set about designing them. And on Thunderbird 2, which was always my favorite, having got a shape for it, knowing that it had to be a, an enormous transporter, it had to have wings. So I designed it with the wings, conventional wings, and looked at it and thought, well, it really does look a bit conventional, so I turned them upside down. And instead of having them trailing back, I had them actually trailing forward, if you can call it trailing forward. I used to wonder as a boy how on earth it ever flew, I have to tell you. Oh, you're not the only one. I mean, with that sort of body and those sort of wings, I'm surprised it ever got off the ground. Mind you, there are lots of times when it didn't, the wires broke, and it crashed to the ground with its motors still burning, and set fire to it. How did you make the launch rockets go, the bangs, the crashes, the, the fire? Well, all the rockets that were put into the vehicles were made by a company called Shermelis. And um, they make a lot of life-saving equipment, you know, rockets for firing life onto a boat from the shore. So we, we gave them the problem and they came up with these little jets. And then we had to just put a little ig igniter into them. And in the end, I think they were actually putting the igniter in. but. They weren't consistent. You know, you'd get one that would fire and spit and then stop right in the middle of the shot. So you've got underneath Thunderbird 2, there were four jets firing down to give it the lift off the ground. And then two would fire in the tail to give it the forward motion. And um, you'd find that three would fire and one wouldn't. And it would always be the one facing camera. So you'd have to start all over again. But they were a godsend, those things. As for explosions, well, then we made them up with gunpowder um, and cortex. Again, a lot depended on what had to happen, but they weren't powerful explosions. They were explosions which are soft explosions, but we would pack over the top of them a lot of debris and then shoot at high speed. So you got those lovely trailing pieces. Sound the alarms. Those are no mere puppets playing second string to all the effects on the hardware. They may have been born as lumps of wood or fiberglass who could move their eyes and lips electronically, but they soon took on a life of their own, or borrowed it rather. The Tracy family bear more than a passing resemblance to old Joe Kennedy's clan, while Troy Tempest is the spitting image of American star James Garner. Maybe that's one of the secrets of their success with adults as well as children, that they reduce the real world and Hollywood to manageable proportions. From the very first series, Christine Glanville helped to make and manipulate Anderson's puppets. They're like a good instrument, a good violin. And whilst you're working on the series with them, their personalities, every puppet, when you're operating it, it develops, it's bound to. I think you've got to be a little bit of an actor. There's some sort of uh, quirk in his character that you can work on. Uh, the voices help a tremendous lot. And uh, we had some very good um, actors and voiceovers. You get a really good voice. I mean, like Parker's in particular, David Graham. Tea, my lady? Oh, thank you. On the lawn, my dear. Oh, yes, my lady. I, I was just wondering, in fact, if I might have the rest of the half to do it off. 
I thought I might take Cook out for a punt. Why, certainly, Parker. You deserve a break. Thank you, milady. I'll just go and change into something more suitable. Before he made the series, we went out to Cookham, near the studio in Slough, where it was made. And uh, he said, oh, there's a bloke here, he's a waiter. You know, I'd like you to listen to, listen to him. And uh, he said, get him going. And, uh, and he came over and he said, uh, would you like to see the way in this, sir? I said, yes, yes, we'd like to see the wine. Listen, Jerry said, you've done, um, where were you before? He said, oh, I worked in the Royal Household, you know. I worked for the Prince of Wales. I said, oh, yes, was he nice? Oh, they don't make them like that anymore, sir. Would you like a claret or a bull jealous? Would, would you like, sir? So we went back again, and, and that was the genesis, really, of the character. And, and all the aspirates and all the other stuff I sort of brought in later. Uh, I created him and he created me. Lady Penelope's pink Rolls Royce raced and rolled through 32 episodes of Thunderbirds. Then came a brand new series and it was Cary Grant who supplied the face to fit a fresh hero. The Mysterons, sworn enemies of Earth possessing the ability to recreate an exact likeness of an object or person. But first, they must destroy. fight one man fate has made indestructible his name captain scarlet francis matthews was the voice of captain scarlet he of the lantern jaw set against the darkest deeds they took us to the studio and showed us the puppets so that we knew what kind of a persona the puppet had and of course scarlet was rather straightforwardly good-looking, dark-haired, blue-eyed, you know, firm-featured and um, kind of um, cultured. So I made him this Cary Grant type character who talks like Dad all the time. <laughs> but I was at uh, ATV a couple of years later after the series had been to America and Roger Moore was there. So I, he and I knew each other and he met me in, in the uh, studios and he said, hey, that series you're doing, he said, they've got Cary Grant's voice you're doing the voice, and they've, they've built the puppet to look like me. He thought it looked like him, Roger. Ah, but James Bond was out on his own. Captain Scarlet has the faithful Captain Blue at his side. Holmes had his Watson, Victoria her Albert, Pearl his Dean, and now there's Scarlet and Blue. Ed Bishop, who played Blue to Francis Matthew Scarlet. Captain Blue was wall-to-wall -wall teeth, peaches and cream complexion, Mr. America, which is what I am. <laughs> Lower down the carriage. S.I.G. No response. A stray bullet must have broken the electrical circuit when I shot through the lock. Try it again. It's no good. We've no choice. I'm taking her down. Get everyone to the rear of the plane and you stay with them, Captain Blue. But Captain... No, this is my job. Now get moving. Spectrum cloud based to Geneva control. This is an emergency. Flight 104 has an undercarriage malfunction. Stand by for crash landing. This is an emergency. of working with Jerry and Reg and the rest of the Century 21 productions was that there was nothing Mickey Mouse about it. Although it was puppets, you were brought in, you played one character and one character only, no matter how big or how small the part was. And B, everybody was on the same money. We got 15 guineas. I'll let you work that out yourself. Uh, and everybody was on the same money, so that made, there was no tensions that so-and-so was getting paid more than I was. The only tensions that existed were between our characters. 
we began to defend our character. Well, Captain Blue wouldn't say that. You know, we find ourselves, then we have to say, hey, wait a minute, guys, these are just puppets. And what they did also is they would record us first. So if vocally we would do something brilliant, uh, which, would, which might just happen with actors occasionally, they would make the puppet, in, in, by raising his eyebrows or twitching or whatever, accommodate that uh, creative reading of the line, which is very good. So we never had to match the puppets. They were always made to match us. Super marionation was how Jerry Anderson described that. The actors' voices were recorded and the sound on the tape then converted into an electronic impulse which was wired into the heads of the puppets so that when they spoke, their lips seemed to be synchronized with the actors' original voices. The more serious that Anderson produced, the more he tried to cut the string that tied him to his puppets. Inside the puppet master was the man who would be a fully-fledged film director. The puppets in the Joe 90 series, the Wunderkind Joe himself, who can absorb electronically the most abstruse expertise the world has to offer, or his adopted father, Professor McLean, are intended to be lifelike. Gone for good are the mannequins or womankins of Thunderbirds and Stingray. I think it was a terrible mistake. The more naturalistic they looked, the less interesting they were, and there was a corresponding blandness, a kind of blandness, both in, in scripts and in voice. And you ended up with uh, something which was, instead of being a parody of human behavior, instead of being a parody of, of the science fiction film of the 50s, was something awfully close to being straight, and it was much more boring. The naturalism scaled the whole thing down. By the end of the 1960s, Anderson had scaled the whole thing up. He was producing his first live-action series. <laughs> UFO was the first of Anderson's fully live-action series to be followed by The Protectors and Space 1999. In UFO, the dreams of the 60s are fading fast. Sunny optimism is soured by midnight doubt. Mankind is on the defensive against aliens from outer space. Still, Shadow is there with Ed Bishop as Commander Straker, their eyes peeled watching the skies for the invader. Shadow stands for Supreme Headquarters Alien Defense Organization. And I'm going to say all this with a straight face. <laughs> its mission was to protect the world against a potential alien invasion through unidentified flying objects. They did exist. The secret organization knew about it. Secret organizations within all the governments of the world knew about it. We couldn't let the world know because there would have been widespread panic. And these guys are coming from across the eons of time and space to come to us because they're from a dying planet and they need the organs from our bodies to infuse their bodies to keep them alive. Get out! Red alert. Interceptors, immediate launch. visual contact. The UFO is lifting off. Order the attack. Andrew Rissick is less convinced by the series. 
I think the problem when you get to the live action stuff is that it just looks awfully run as a mill. It doesn't have any of the invention and the scale. I mean, in, in puppets, you can blow up the Empire State Building. You can't do that in real life. Do you feel that, perhaps like all really imaginative program makers for television, that in the end what has happened for Anderson is that television in general across the whole world, but particularly in America and Britain, caught up with him? I'm not sure. I think that's probably partly true. One of the things that fascinated me about, about these series is, was that I think they created, a, in a lot of people, a, a taste for something which you only otherwise satisfied through Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, or the Bond films. I think, too, that he inspired and interested so many people that, in the end, people started to do the same thing. He was ripped off by other people, I mean, for very good imaginative reasons, and he sort of got left behind. I think that probably has happened, but it's difficult to say because he didn't go on making programs, and if he had, he might have surprised us. I hope we'll see Space Police very soon. The trouble is that Jerry Anderson can't find a television network who are prepared to buy what he hints is a kind of Hill Street blues in space, despite the fact that he's already made a one-hour pilot for the series. It's true that his last series, Terror Hawks, with puppets, not people, was more of a success with children than critics, but even off-form, Jerry Anderson's work fires the imagination more than that of his hordes of imitators on both sides of the Atlantic. And yet, if you believe Ed Bishop, the man who made all this possible, who invented TV science fiction, has never quite understood what he did. He is a wonderful creator. I think, personally, he yearns to be creative himself. I think he would like to be a director. And I think, at the time when we were working, uh, he had that yearning, but he didn't realize that he had the most supreme creative uh, gift, was to get a lot of neurotic people together and make them create, the designers and the writers and the, the actors and the, the lighting photographer and all the rest, get all these guys together and preside over them and guide them along his predetermined track. And that is a gift, and to make it all come up you know, throw all those cards up in the air and make them all come down in the right order is, is a fantastic gift. And Jerry's got this in hearts and spades. All right, Matthew, into the case you go. Sabe che da documentario o Super Marination, Raina, mi fai girare la data Super Marination, Nicole. 
اجن وشان على باوس شهرت ريكلامي متى سنجو اتيرت بارتي سنراو انترفيستا بارتيكولاري مع جيري اندرسون عليك باومانا ان كل ماكم فتيت منوتي اخرى البوم ريتراتي لورا في زمير Thank you.